Hit the Target Podcast. Hello and welcome to Hit the Target, powered by Hollywood Bets. I'm your host, Deshaun, and with me in studio today is Amazulu footballer, Wade Yester. How's it, man? Good, Wade. How are you doing today? No, I'm good. I'm good. I can't complain. Shut. Thank you so much for coming in studio and, you know, speaking to the football viewers. You know, we are very excited to have you. As a seasoned professional such as yourself, I think a good place to start today is at the beginning. Tell us where the love for football stems from. Um, I think it, it started with my father. Um, he was somebody that played football, you know, and as a, as a young boy growing up and you see your father leave for trainings and leave for matches and things, you just want to follow your father. You just want to do whatever your father does. Right. So that was me uh, growing up. I just wanted to follow my father wherever he went to. Um, when he went to trainings, I went with him. Uh, obviously because of school and things, my father trained in the evening, mm. so there were times where I was restricted by my mother, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't go out and, and stuff, but I'd always wait for him. So when he comes back home, he always used to leave his shin pads and his socks on. Then I would have the job of taking his shin pads and his right. socks off because I had like such a passion for football. Yeah. And then obviously on the weekends when he'd leave for his games and stuff, that would be in the afternoon. And I'd be there with a the ball in my hand. <laughs> I'd always used to wait for like half times and stuff and then once the field is open I'll go in the field and I'll you know just play around with the ball 100%. so yeah my father yeah um, that being said was there any other idol maybe a football player uh, that you aspire to be like a role model per se I think from the beginning it was always uh, David Beckham mm. I always used to look up to him um, he was my icon also uh, as a Man United fan I always used to <laughs> idolize David Beckham a lot <laughs> Um, but also growing up playing like uh, in the younger divisions, uh, I used to watch a lot of football. So the once I, I think it was at the 2002 World Cup uh, mm. when Rivaldo scored one of his goals. He took his jersey off. So uh, we played a semi-final the once under 13 it was. Right. And I remember scoring like a last minute goal. And as I scored, I also took my jersey off. Yeah. So it's always See, been just even, a uh, passion. Even today, you're still without that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so as you're saying, it's a passion of yours, eh? Yeah, yeah. No, it's always been a passion of mine. All right. Well, uh, you know, maybe you can elaborate on what it's like to come through the ranks. You know, speak to us about the grassroots football in the country. You know, are there any tournaments, any maybe highlights, memories, goals that you scored? Um, you know, in your early childhood development? I think growing up, there's always been like a lot of tournaments. Um, the engine tournament being one. Um, and I played in, in a tournament called the Bail, the Bail tournament. All right. Um, that's based in Cape Town. And I think that's where I really made my mark. Um, we were in the same group as, as IX Cape Town. Back then, there were IX Cape Town. And I remember we played the opening game just after the fireworks and stuff. And the stadium was packed. That was the first time for me playing in front of, it was 22,000 people at the stadium and I was scared standing in the tunnel. Yeah. And you'd, you'd just see these IX guys next yeah. to you and they look so calm and they chilled. And I remember asking the one IX guy, I said, hey, are you not nervous? He says, no, this is normal for us. So I'm like, oh, mm. okay, no problem. My first touch on the ball was a goal wow. against IX. Imagine that. Yeah, so then, we were leading 1-0. Ajax came back into the game. They scored one. They scored another one. Right. So we were like, I, you know what? It's their home in front of their fans. They probably deserved this like, to, to beat us 2-1. There was like five minutes left in the game. I got a through ball. That time I was a winger. I got a through ball. I'm one and one of the keeper. I scored. <laughs> so now it's 2-2 and there's like a few minutes left. So the exact same action happened again. Like with a minute left to go, and I'm one and one of the keeper. Right. So instead of scoring, I saw I looked I lift up my head and I saw a teammate of mine wide open. I you bend it like Beckham. I just slid <laughs> in the ball and, and we won. So immediately after that game, there were so many scouts, you know, after me, um, and it was confusing at the time because you don't know what to make of it as a youngster. Like so many teams are chasing you and all that. And then luckily my parents were with me in Cape Town and my father helped me with the decision. Mm. So, would, yeah. would you say that's maybe the cardinal moment when you knew you were going to make it as a footballer or would you say there was something else? I think I would never say that I thought at that time I was going to make it as a footballer because for me, one of the most important people in my life, my father, he was always somebody that helped me stay grounded. Like he always used to tell me like, this thing requires a lot of hard work. Yeah. 
you are far from making it. So there's people now that want you, but that doesn't mean that you're going to play professionally. Because how many people, do, how many guys do I know of that played in academies in South Africa that slowly but surely they just started drifting away, right. drifting away. Yeah. For many reasons, for various reasons. But like I said, I always had my father by my side, you know, just reminding me constantly, reminding me, look, you're going to have to work hard at this. Yeah. Even at school level, um, I won't lie, I, was, I hated my father. Hate is a strong word, but I hated my father because friends of mine would be going out to parties and stuff on the weekends, and then I'd ask, Daddy, please, just, you know, just this one. I'll only go for an hour. Right. Knowing very well you're lying, you're not going to go yeah. for an hour. <laughs> but then I'd tell him, look, I'm only going to be, like, you know, an hour, I'm only going to be two hours. Then he would remind me, look, this is what you want. Mm. And this is what you need to do to get there. So this thing, this parties and stuff that you want to go to now, is not going to help you get there. It's just going to derail you. Yeah. And at that time, as a youngster, you don't see that. You don't see the fact that one party is going to derail you. You just see that this is your goal, you want to get there. But on the side, you also want to have fun. You also want to enjoy yourself because you were a child at the end of the day. And at that, like I said, at that time, that didn't make sense to me, the fact that I couldn't enjoy myself. Yeah. But now, looking back at my career, like this is going to be my 12th season in the PSL now, and I can gladly say, you know, I'm grateful for my father for the role he's, he's played in my life. Yeah. Because if it wasn't for him telling me no back then, then maybe I wouldn't be sitting here on this podcast with you today. Yeah, 100%. Um, would you say that maybe that discipline, that sacrifice, is what maybe causes some people to not make it as professionals? I think so. I think discipline is a, is a big, big factor in being a professional. Um, knowing when to do things and knowing how to do things uh, plays a big role. Like, because you have to tell yourself constantly that, you know, like I said now with parties and stuff, every weekend, like even during the week, there's parties, yeah. and there's, you know, there's, there's everything that can like take your focus away from being a professional. But you have to constantly remind yourself, look, this is what I want, no matter how hard this is, this is what I want, and I want to achieve that. Because through my whole high school career, people used to ask me, so what are you going to do when, because that, that question always comes up in high school, yeah. like, what are you going to study after school? What do you want to be after school? Then I used to tell them, I want to play professional football. Mm. And they'd laugh that. at me, because at my school, especially from PE, there wasn't a lot of, at that time, there wasn't a lot, a lot of, people or players that came from PE that went on to play professionally then they were like about how how there's no academies in PE how are you going to get seen so I was like adamant about it I said no I'm going to play professional football yeah well actually maybe you can take us through your your journey because I know you signed with Blum Celtic um, obviously you went on to play for Golden Arrows as well uh, and Highlands Park of course leading up to your move with Orlando Pirates but maybe those uh, those first three clubs that I mentioned if you could summarize um, what happened? What was happening each stage, each club? It's quite a, it's quite a long, long and complicated journey, if I can call it that. Um, I actually wasn't supposed to end up at Celtic. Um, I actually, there was a, I was playing Vodacom League in PE at that time. It was called Vodacom League. So there was a, a teammate of mine that played with me. He was a bit older than me, and he said to me the one day, he said, hey, don't you want to play professional football? And that time I was 18. So I was like, yeah, of course I want to play. So he said to me, okay, look, well, I have somebody in Choburg that's willing to look at you. Yeah. Um, but obviously you have to pay your own way. Will your parents be able to? And fortunately uh, for me at that time, my parents were able, you know, to, to yeah, buy to me, fund a, the, to get me a flight yeah. and whatever. I flew up to Choburg. I was under the impression that I was going to be training with the team at that time. I packed a big suitcase, flew up to Joburg, got to Joburg the morning. I landed there, the bus came to pick me up, went to the training ground. When I got to the training ground, there's probably about 400 or 500 guys there. And it looked like an open trial. Right. But I was told that it was not an open trial for me. I was going to be training with the actual team. I got there. Caught my suitcase and then the coach at that time, he looked at me and he said, uh, why are you standing with your suitcase? Go put on your boots, you're going to play. So then imagine like my thinking, I, I just landed now and now I get told that I'm still young 
and now I'm obviously nervous because if the coach is going to speak to me like that, then like I don't I don't feel welcome. I played for ten minutes. I scored a goal. I remember played for ten minutes. Everybody came off. Um, they chose a few guys, and then they told the rest of us, um, "Unlucky, but go try your luck somewhere else." Just like that. The harsh reality of football. Exactly. Yeah. And then I, I thought to myself, "So what's going to happen now?" Because I packed a full suitcase, and I got told, "You're going to be here for at least a week." I phoned my mother immediately. I told my mother, "I don't want to play football anymore. Mm. It's that's too much for me." At imagine at that age. I told my mother, this is too much for me. I'd rather come home, I'll study, whatever. I don't want to play football anymore. My mother said to me, okay, take 30 minutes to calm down, think about everything, and I'll call you back. She phoned me back. Uh, she asked me, are you sure this is what you want to do? Because we support you. Mm. If you want to go and study, you can go study, no problem. But just remember, if you're going to leave this now, don't look back one day and you're going to have so much like regret about you just leaving this thing. So I said to my mother, so what must I do now? So she said, phone the guy that got you the trial and ask him what's the way forward. So he said to me, okay, look, well, there's obviously some confusion there, but he has another connection and this guy is in Bloemfontein. Am I willing to take the bus tonight from Joburg to Bloemfontein? I said... With your suitcase, with everything. Yeah, imagine, yeah? imagine. And then I said to him, you know what? I'm already here. Yeah. You know what? And this thing of me just quitting now, it's gone. Like that 30 minutes helped me to relax and everything. Let me go to Bloom. I think I jumped on the bus eight, 8 o'clock the evening. I got into Bloom around about 3 a.m., half past 3 in the morning. So then I got told in Bloom I'm going to be training with Roses United. That was the NFD team at the time. And then when I got into Bloom, I also got told, but the Roses isn't in in bloom for this weekend because they have a away game so i must wait until monday so i said okay no it's not a problem i'll, I'll chill in bloom at least it's better than what happened to me in Joburg, where i literally just landed and i had to train so i said okay i'll wait till monday then i got another call that morning and the same guy that got me the trial said to me look um molifi molifi in seki the, the the guy that was the coach at chiefs and who was the national team coach he is the head of development at Celtic. He said, look, why don't you go train with the Celtic reserve side for the weekend? Then at least you're keeping yourself busy. And then Monday comes, you start training with the Roses. I said, okay, no problem. I'll do that. I trained with him the Saturday morning, twice, two training sessions, the morning and the afternoon. The Sunday morning, Molefi came, Coach Molefi came to um, the accommodation where I was staying. He said to me, look, I have seen enough of you. I don't want you to go to Roses. He said to me, I want you to come. I want you to play in the reserve team at Celtic. He said, I'll give you six months. You're going to be in the first team. I said, okay, no problem. He said, is, is your parents willing to let you come and stay in the free state? I said, yeah, because that's why I'm here. He said, okay, go home. I went back down to PE the Sunday on a bus. The Monday evening, I drove back up. What are your feelings though? Because I'm sure for a manager to come to you and say, I'll give you six months before you actually progress to the first team, which is, I mean... For me, it was, it was mixed emotions and mixed feelings because like at the time I went within the space of a day, I went from being told basically that I wasn't good enough, basically to being told, look, in six months time, you'll be ready to play in the PSL. So then I was like, you know what? Everything happens for a reason. Right. This had to happen, that rejection that I got in Joburg had to happen. So now I've ended up here in Bloom. So let me give this thing a good shot. You know, I have nothing to lose because I've been given an opportunity here that a lot of youngsters don't get. So let me take this opportunity and let me run with it. And then it didn't take six months, it took a bit longer because um, I stayed there for a full season. But I always used to go and train with the first team. Like I trained in the morning with the first team and then in the afternoon I trained with the reserve team. And whenever the first team had friendlies, I would go and, you know, get a few minutes with the first team players just so that I can get acquainted with the team, with the system. Yeah. At that time, be exposed to that environment, exactly. that high pressure scenarios. And at that time, uh, Clinton Larson was the coach at Celtic and he loved using youngsters. So he always used to speak to me. I always used to go to first team trainings, to the friendlies and things like that. And I always used to go to the first team games 
um, you know, to get the feel of it. And for me, it was so nice. You know, it was such a nice atmosphere. Bloemfontein is one of the best or the, the, the most supported teams in the country at that time. And it was so nice. Mm. And of course, you've seen that more recently with the Bafana Bafana um, team playing, uh, I think it was Zimbabwe over there. It must have brought back fun memories for you. Yeah, I know that. I, for me, like I said, I can even say it now. Like, they have the best supporters in the country. Yeah. You know, never mind the, the, the top three in the country, your Pirates, your Chiefs, your Sundowns. Like, that is not a top three team, but the, the amount of supporters that they get and the way the supporters are so passionate there, I'm happy that they have another team now to support. Yeah, of course, 100%. Um, of course, it wasn't uh, long thereafter before you were on the books of Orlando Pirates, the Soweto Giants, the mighty Buccaneers. Tell us, what was that scouting process like? I think it happened, the move happened way before the move actually happened. Um, I signed for Arrows way before I signed for Pirates and then we had played Pirates, I think, in a cup match. At that time, it was the Telcom knockout. So we played them, I think it was last 16. And um, I scored a free kick against Pirates. And that game, I was playing left back. I have no idea why I was playing left back, but Coach Clinton always used to use me in different positions. So I played at left back, and I think I had one of the best games in my career that wow. day. And I scored a free kick, and we lost the game 2-1. But then immediately after the game, as we're leaving uh, Orlando Stadium, somebody stopped me and it was an agent. And he was like, do you have an agent? So I said, yeah, I do have an agent. So he said, look, there's people here that's interested in you. But for now, it's just interest. So he said, give me a call when you get back to your hotel and we'll speak more. So I gave him a call and he told me, look, um, these people are interested in you, but they're going to monitor you just to see like, if this is not a flash in the pan performance from you. And for me, it, it gave me more confidence going into the other games. Yeah. Because now I know there's, there's one of these big teams in the country that's after me. The, fall, the, the games came after that followed. I scored. I scored. I scored. I think I had in the first five or so games that I was at Arrows, I scored something like three or four goals and I had mm. a good few assists as well. So, at that time, they wanted to sign me. Yeah, I mean, you're performing in the league as well as in a knockout uh, fixture, so... Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, and then, um, like, I was so excited because that was my first season at Arrows. And I got told, look, you... Pirates are, is yeah, watching Pirates you, is interested yeah. in you. And I spoke to so many people. I, I said, look, what would you do? Um, I got told, look, if I was you, I'd go. Yeah. Football is a short career. You might never get another chance to play for a big team. I was you, I'd go. But obviously, I was still contracted at, at Arrows, and then there were certain complications about um, them not wanting me to leave because they didn't want to lose one of their key players. To which, like, I, I understood, like, to a certain extent, I understood. Um, so there was nothing that I could do at that, at that time. It's not like I could say to the chair lady at Arrows, look, I want to leave. Yeah. Just give me my clearance, no, I want to leave. Because, like I said, I was still under contract. Yeah. Um, so it was a bit frustrating and annoying at the time that I couldn't leave. And also that um, my father and I grew up supporting Pirates, or always Pirates supporters. So yeah, it was a bit frustrating, but then, you know, Pretty I just... Moved, though. Yeah, it was. I mean, who are the thoughts from um, you exactly. know, supporting them as a, as, a, as a fan to wearing the jersey and playing for them on the pitch? Exactly. Like when, when you watch the, the games, the, the games live, when you're at the stadium or even if you're watching like on TV, the way the supporters just, you know, yeah. flood that stadium, it's, it's amazing. Mm. So, yeah. Well, yeah, during your time at Pirates, you played under Joseph Zimbabwe. Now, the man has just led Raja to an undefeated season in the Moroccan Botala Pro League. Did you see any of his tactics, um, you know, his greatness, his, um, you know, his uh, tactical analysis maybe, um, during your time at Pirates? I think uh, I saw his greatness from the beginning when I joined Pirates. He was a, a German coach. He's the second German coach that I worked under, Ernst being the first. But you could see that uh, like he was so hard on discipline. Yeah. He was so hard on working hard. Um, so you could see that this, this was somebody with a plan. Like, you know, he wanted to make history, even at that time with Pirates. He, 
he wanted history with the club. And then after being there for, I think, three months, we made history with the club because we were the first team to win a trophy for the club in, I think, like eight years or yeah. something like that. So he was a very, very, very good coach. Like I said, he was hard on discipline. He was hard on tactics. Like he knew exactly what he wanted. He knew exactly how to beat certain teams in the league. He knew when, when you go to this team, how to beat them. He knew when you go to this team, when you play at home, there's no compromise. We have to win at home. Yeah. You know, even a draw at Orlando yeah. is not good enough. <laughs> and you'd feel that, you'd feel that at Pirates, because I was actually speaking to a teammate of mine yesterday. He asked me, hey, how is it at Pirates? I said, but with the pressure mm. at Pirates is something else. Like, you can, you can draw a game and yeah. feel like you did well. But just go to the petrol station and go fill up your car. And they give it to you. Yeah. Know, yeah. <laughs> they'll want to know what's happening. Yeah. You thinking you had such a good game yesterday. Then they ask you, what, are you injured? Or yeah. What's wrong? Why are you not giving you all for the team? Gosh. And then what do, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, does a directive like that come from the top? You know, uh, Ivan Corsa, Dr. Ivan Corsa, shall I say, being at the helm of Pirates for, I mean, as many years as I can count. What is his relationship with the club like? Do you see him? Maybe you can offer us some insight into the uh, Iron Man. I think it's it's expected at a, at a club like Pirates. Uh, let me not say a club or institution like Pirates. It's expected trophies are supposed to be associated with Pirates. You're supposed to have that winning mentality at Pirates. Um, and you know the, they they call the, the supporters the happy people. Mm. They just want to be happy. You know they don't care how you get the trophies they just want you know they they want to come to the stadium they want to see you win they want to watch good football and they're happy to see you like when i'm in the malls and things like that they're happy to see their players and that's when you feel you feel that sense of you know, acknowledgement yeah. you understand and i think um dr Koza built that from you know, many many years now and like i said it's, it's expectant when you are at pirates like when you when you walk into the training um the training field at Rand Stadium, like you see all these pictures and stuff on the side of the trophies that they've won back in the day, and you feel that it's, it's something different. Like you know, even when you like, I know it's it's silly for me to say like when you put on the jersey or whatever, when you put on a pirate jersey, you can feel like that weight on on your shoulders. Like this is not an ordinary team. Mm. This is a big team, and it's expectant of you to perform. It's expectant of you to do well. You know, you need to keep yourself to a certain a level yeah. at Pirates. I can imagine a lot of hard work goes into um, the preparation and the, the physical strain. Do you want to maybe tell us, do you feel hard work beats talent? Or does talent beat hard work? Because it's an age-old question in football. I think for me, I've, I've always been, me personally, I've always been a hard worker. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's always been hard work over talent. But then I've come across a lot of players that I've been teammates with and things like that where they, they are solely based on talent. And you just think to yourself, well, look, if you could just work like a little bit harder, like where do you know where you could yeah. find yourself? Because I, I won't lie, I've never been the most talented of players, but when I'm on the field, I work hard. Mm. Like I will run until, you know, if I get taken off, I must get taken off and I must be tired when I get taken off. Mm. So I will always stand behind uh, hard work over talent because it can the hard work can make a big difference like for me an example is when you're playing a game and things are not going your way there's always those games where you know things don't go your way as a player like maybe it's just that one game where you're under, underperforming right but your that's where your hard work comes in like you can still run you can still work for the team and things yeah. like that so if you base your career solely on talent that's where you're going to fall short for yeah me. Well, of course, it was that hard work that led you to a uh, pre-season trial, I believe, with the Amazulu before eventually signing for um, Usutu. Do you want to maybe tell us what your relationship with the club is like, what uh, the GMP Pablo, Franco, Martin, um, what he's like on a day-to-day, -day, um, you know, match day preparations, um, you know, and maybe how important Silverware is? Yeah, I know my relationship with the club is very, very good. Um... I know everybody at the club now. I've met the president, um, the CEO, everybody. Um, so I have a good relationship with them. I feel like even uh, last season, we had a decent season, but not we, like we should have ended up. Um, but yeah, Coach, Coach Pablo, he's also 
very very good very very good coach uh is also very hard on discipline um tactical work is very hard on tactical work um uh, is very prepared um even when we play friendlies but there's no such thing as friendlies for coach pablo yeah you have to win a friendly and i think that's a good mentality to have as a coach because it rubs off on the players as well because if you as a player can see okay this coach is very serious even about winning a friendly so that's going to you know going to go over to the league matches to the cup matches and i feel like we were very very close last season if you look at um, the first 6 months of the league there was the black label cup uh we beat chiefs away from home we came back to durban we beat arrows at moses and then we found ourselves in the semi finals against ts galaxy and um it just it just wasn't going for us and i felt i felt like at that time everything was in our hands because we played ts galaxy in durban and the final was also in durban so i felt like that was for us but it wasn't meant to be but i i still feel like we can win something even this season yeah. um with the players that we have we have very 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 good players we have players that has won things at previous clubs you know players with experience yeah. we have youth in the team within the team so it's important to have that balance of experience and youth especially like i said players that has won things before so that uh, the younger guys in the team can learn from those experienced players yeah well you know with the, those players there they do need fans at the stadium and you know at some of the games at mos mabida maybe it's not quite selling out how important does the fan base um, of the club getting them into the stadium what does it do to the players mentality or the ups a lot or the ups a lot um, especially sometimes when you, when you play against the bigger teams so called yeah. bigger teams when you play pirates chiefs or sundowns you know the stadiums always packed so and you know majority of the time the when you play against pirates or sundowns or chiefs it's not really our supporters yeah. but i feel like playing in a packed out stadium playing against the best teams in the country just does something to the players as well like for me you don't need any more motivation right that's motivation enough like you want to beat the big 3 teams in the country mm. you want to play in front of a packed out stadium so yeah that makes a, a very very big difference yeah um the president uh, sandile zungo of course has reinforced the coaching department bringing in vusi balakazi um what do you feel about his impact um at the club and how is he going to reinforce that uh, that ddc team i feel that's a very good addition to the team i also feel like um he's going to make a big difference within the ddc team because he was uh, the coach of the ddc team when i was at arrows yeah and we always used to play friendlies against them and they would always give us a hard time so he is obviously a coach that knows what he's doing he knows how to get the best out of the youth so i f- i feel like we're going to see um a lot from our ddc team this this season as well yeah okay um i guess finally my uh, question to you would be you've played in in calf football um before can you maybe tell us what the level of competition is like when you play outside of the country at something else yeah at something else like i i played for two seasons in the in the calf competition and my first season was such a eye opener like you'd go to these north african countries and these guys are big like you, we were in libya we played in libya these guys are massive massive compared to our guys but then like one little touch and they'd fall and they'd cry for their refs and things like that and we actually got told like the first the so called first time as in calf we got told that when you go away from home it's going to be tough yeah so we didn't know to what sense they were speaking because i thought okay it's going to be tough the level of football when it came to the level of football we were matching them if not better than them away from home but it's just like tactically not like they they were playing more mind games than anything like you'd go away from home it will be more fine margins really exactly yeah, yeah. it will be so hostile cuz like i said we, when we were in libya libya was of course like a war zone like a few years ago so when we were there the roads were just gravel mm. you drive to the stadium in a small bus and then on your way to the stadium people will be hitting the bus and things like that so arriving at the stadium already you it's kind of like a little bit of nerves but it was a nice learning experience because you you actually got an experience of how people play away from home yeah. and then how people play at home 
an example of that is we played um, a team from Nigeria in Yimba. The first league was at Orlando Stadium. They came to Orlando Stadium and they sat in a block for 90 minutes. They didn't want to attack anything, they just defended. We beat them, I think 1-0. And then when we went to Nigeria for the second leg, we thought, okay, we know how this, te this team plays. They're going to yeah. sit, they didn't attack anything at Orlando. Obviously, if you do have like some attacking players, there's going to be, you know. We played in Nigeria at 11 at night. Wow. It was 33 yeah. degrees Gosh. at 11 at night. Then, all of a sudden, they turned into Man City in Nigeria. <laughs> they were playing football. We were chasing the ball in yeah. that heat. And we played on an artificial field. We were chasing the ball. So it was just like an eye-opener. Like teams, when they go away from home, they have a certain way of playing. They have yeah. a certain level of playing. And then they know, once you come to their home ground, they're going to do everything possible to unsettle yeah. you as a team. <laughs> I see. Um, thanks so much, Ferenc. Wait, it's been a pleasure unpacking all things football related with you. Um, football fans, I hope you enjoyed this latest episode of Hit the Target podcast powered by Hollywood Bets. You can let us know in the comments what your favorite part of the podcast was and uh, maybe send a shout out to Mr. Yuster over here. Um, from all of us in studio, thanks and goodbye. Hit the Target podcast.